A Stuart Beam Engine Refurbishment. This is Part 5, Continuing the Reassembly. The next part to fit to the engine is the inlet manifold. The steam union is at the side of the manifold, and the end of the inlet manifold, which is the closest to the camera, is threaded quarter by 32 threads per inch to take a standard Stuart Models lubricator. And I'm fitting this with the help of some Loctite 542, just to make sure that it doesn't leak. This is a standard displacement lubricator that you fill with steam oil, open the valve one turn, and as the steam from the boiler enters the manifold, some of this steam condenses to water in the lubricator and displaces the oil, which is carried into the valve chest and lubricates the slide valve and the cylinder. This is the exhaust arrangement from the engine. I've made a piece of brass piping, which is threaded at each end, quarter by 40 threads per inch, and I'm screwing this into a PM Research 90 degree elbow. These small cast elbows from PM Research really are excellent and really look the part. I buy these PM Research 90 degree elbows from a company in England, and the company is called Forest Classics, and the web address is on the screen at the moment. I'm fitting the top side rail. This assembly is called an entablature, and this is the part of the engine that supports the Watts parallel motion. Pardon the pun, but what is Watts parallel motion? It's a fiendishly clever system that allows the arc that's described by the beam to be kept constant to move the piston up and down. If you think about it for long enough, its function becomes obvious. Time now to fit the bearings that support the beam. They're slightly bigger than the ones that support the crankshaft, but the bolt in place pretty much the same as the crankshaft ones do. Once again, I deburred the holes underneath to make sure that these bearings sit very flat on the top of the column. And don't forget, never over tighten these small bolts because two things may happen. One is the bolt could shear off and the other thing is the pressure could distort the bearing. This clip clearly shows how far the bearing block is lifted off the top of the column. Once I remove this burr, the bearing block sits perfectly flat on top of the column. Originally someone had fitted a piece of flat shim steel in the centre of the bearing block to make sure it sat level on top of the column but really all that needed to be done was to remove the burr which was stopping the bearing block from sitting level in the first place. Very strange. I can't decide which way up the beam's supposed to be. I think this is possibly upside down. There's a cast in reinforcement in the beam and this is to take a grub screw in order to clamp the beam support shaft to the beam. I've had a look on Google Images and on there some are shown with the beam this way up and some are shown with the beam the other way up so I'm really not sure which way it is. It doesn't really matter, the beam looks okay both ways. If you fit the beam the other way up though you cannot see this really nice casting reinforcing part. What will probably happen is I'll wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat thinking oh no I've put the beam on the wrong way round. Anyway that's enough of that. What I'm doing at the moment is tightening the cylinder onto the bed plate. If you remember from the last episode, I did mention about not tightening the cylinder onto the bed plate until right at the end. So I've got the beam at its lowest point, so the piston is at the bottom of its stroke, and now I'm aligning the cylinder with the beam. On any steam engine, all the moving parts have to be as free as possible, and the way to achieve this is to make sure that everything lines up. So now the cylinder lines up with the beam, and the beam and cylinder are very free. When I rock the beam back and forth, it moves very freely. Now I'm going to oil it with some machine oil and see if that makes a difference. None of the parts are tight. The watts parallel motion is not slack and it's not tight. It's fairly perfect. And now when I move the beam with a bit of oil, it really is very free moving. The only resistance I can feel is the resistance of the O-ring against the cylinder wall. By the look of the cylinder wall, which is not the most perfect glass-like finish I've ever seen, this engine hasn't done too much running, hardly any at all I would think, so I'm going to give it a fair bit of running, I'll probably run it on the bench on compressed air for a full week or so like I normally do, and that's what I've been doing with my Stuart 5A. All week, every day for about an hour, I've been running it, and it's starting to run a lot better. When I rock the beam back and forth in this clip, you can see how the watts parallel motion works. Because if you think about it, if you didn't have this parallel motion, then at each end of the travel the beam would try and bend the piston rod. The next thing to do is to clean up the connecting rod. 
This has a bolt all the way through it that serves no function, it's just decorative. So temporarily I've removed that so I can use some wet or dry sandpaper to really clean up the big end. This Stuart Models beam engine is an ideal first model to have a go at building if you haven't built one before because it's very simple to make and it builds very much like a Victoria. If you'd care to take a look at my How to Build a Steam Engine series, you really will see the similarities between the parts used on a Victoria steam engine and the parts used on this type of beam engine. Here I'm refitting the nut and bolt through the big end, and as I mentioned, that's only there for decorative purposes. In the next episode, I complete the assembly of the engine and give it a test run on compressed air. So until then, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.